for Laura's brother's wedding. Um, I remember it being hot outside, and it was it was in the low 90s, upper 80s, low 90s. Um, uh, uh, but I remember we were standing in the shade, and it just didn't seem that bad. And someone told me the temperatures are in the 90s. I thought, well, it doesn't feel like that at all. Um, but it's just because it's such a dry heat that the humidity is down. Now, there are places in Arizona where Laura's other brother lived, and he gets up to be over 100 degrees. And he said, at a certain point, it doesn't matter, humidity or not, it's hot. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's, you know, any humidity. It just, when it gets too hot, it just gets hot. But anyhow, but praise the Lord. It doesn't feel too bad in here tonight. As long as I don't move around too much, I'll be okay. <laughs> We're in the book of Romans tonight. Romans chapter number 9. We already started the book of Romans. <clears throat> we looked at... Um, the first 24 verses, and we're going to maybe look at some of those verses a little bit as we get into our lesson this evening, uh, but then we're going to definitely look at the rest of the verses, verses 25 through 33, and then I'm going to talk to you about something specific this evening, um, uh, something I think that is a, a challenge for us, as I'm going to give some practical lessons tonight. Um, uh, on, uh, uh, on a specific topic. And so um, let's, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our chapter tonight, Romans uh, chapter number nine. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you so much for this time we have to be in your word tonight. Lord, I pray that you would use this Bible study, Lord, to speak to our hearts. Uh, and Lord, may we learn more about you as we consider um, what your word says, and uh, Lord, may it affect us, may it make a difference in our hearts and lives. Thank you so much, Lord, that you did leave us with your word, and that we do have instruction on, on how to live our lives. Um, bless during this time, Lord. Help us to follow. Help us to understand what your word says. May it make a difference in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Romans chapter number nine, the whole theme of Romans 9 is God's sovereignty, okay? And specifically, in his sovereignty, he will show us mercy. And so the whole theme of Romans 9 really is that God will show mercy to us. Notice, if you would, verse number 15. Well, verse number 14 says, What shall we say then? Is there any unrighteousness with God? God forbid, verse 15, For he saith to Moses... I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 16, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Notice if you would, verse number 18, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he, uh, and whom he will he hardeneth. So the theme... <coughs> Uh, in, in this chapter, chapter number 9, is God's mercy. And God, in his sovereignty, can decide to show mercy to us. Now, that may sound a little strange, but the truth is one could make the argument, and really a rather strong, strong argument, that how can God show mercy to us because rightly we should be judged for our sins and God could judge us for our sins and condemn us to hell and rightfully so however God in his sovereignty says all right I will show mercy to man and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy and God says I can do that because God is sovereign and can do whatever he wants to do so we see in this theme in Romans chapter number nine that that we have God showing us mercy he is under no obligation to show us mercy uh, in fact, it would be right for him to judge us. And we, we looked at that. Okay? Um, uh, but he decides he is going to show us mercy. I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about mercy or lessons about mercy. You and I have an opportunity to show mercy ourselves. And so by way of practical application, I want to talk to you a little bit about mercy and how we can show mercy ourselves. It is difficult, it is a difficult thing for us to find the balance between mercy and judgment. So we see here that God in his sovereignty is going to show us mercy. 
And God can do that. And he demonstrates in a couple different ways how he is sovereign. All right. But then he says here that in verse number 23, that all this is done for his glory, right? Verse 23, uh, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had uh, for prepared unto glory. So he is showing the fact that he is merciful um, and that he is sovereign and can do this. Uh, and in fact, his, his reluctancy or his willingness to hold back his wrath on those that deserve it, that's verse number 22. His, his, his holding back his wrath, okay, is actually bringing glory to himself, showing that, okay, he could, you know, bring down wrath, but he doesn't. He's long-suffering, okay? Vessels of wrath uh, fitted to destruction. He, he showed much long-suffering to the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Um, and so we see here that he does show mercy and uh, that uh, he, he rightfully could bring down judgment, but... The fact that he's showing mercy is bringing glory to himself. Um, and, and I'm tossed right now between whether to just go through these verses or to get into the points that I have for tonight. But we're, we're going to go into the, the, the points that I have, the outline that I have for this evening. So Romans chapter 9, the whole theme is God's mercy. It is difficult for you and I, all right, to balance this idea of mercy and judgment. Um, and uh, after all, the Bible does say that we are to have uh, proper judgment. The Bible does say we are to have, um, you know, proper uh, chastising and, and proper okay, rebuke. Um, Proverbs chapter 9, verse number 8 says, Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. All right, if you have someone who is wise, when he is rebuked, he will realize the error of his ways and make smart choices. And then he, would, uh, uh, he will love you for rebuking him. Proverbs 19.25 says, And reprove one that hath understanding. So if you reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. He will gain more understanding. So there clearly is a place for reproof. All right? And those who have understanding that are reproved will gain more understanding. Job 5.17 says, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. All right, you're a happy person if God corrects you and God chastens you, all right? And, uh, and, and we certainly see the place where God should chasten, God should correct. Proverbs 20, verse number 30. The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly, okay? There is a place for proper correction. There is a place for judgment. In fact, with an interesting study is the word rod in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs. Now, we live in a day and age when uh, we are very much, you know, uh, there, there are many, many philosophies, and I talk about this a lot, right? There are many philosophies in this world that are um, in contrary to the Bible, the word of God. It is getting to the place now where certain philosophies uh, that this world teaches has become a moral of standard of right and wrong in the world's eyes, and to even, you know, as they begin to try to legislate right and wrong, all right, they it is becoming even, in some places of the, of the country, even illegal, or you get yourself in a lot of trouble if you say things, even though it's from the Word of God, but it goes against what the world says is right and wrong. Um, and there's a lot of topics we could bring up that would be that way. Um, but one of those topics would be the proper way of raising your children and correcting your children. Now, the Bible teaches very specifically, and we're going to look at some of these verses, um, how to correct children and how to raise them right. Oftentimes today, this world has a whole different philosophy on that, and they will look at some of these things as abusive. Proverbs 10, 13 says, In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Proverbs 13, 25, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Or he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Proverbs 14, 3, In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of wise shall perverse them. Proverbs 22, 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. You know, it is our sin nature. That's a pretty interesting verse. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. When do you make some of your most foolish decisions in life? When you're very young. 
you know, there's a reason why car insurance is so expensive for a young man. <laughs> uh, there's a reason why the life expectancy is, you know, at a certain rate for any young man who owns and drives one of those crotch rocket mo mo motorcycles. And there's a certain percentage of people who, who young men at the, from the age of 20 to 25 who are expected to just die if they own one of those. Um, because at that age, you make very foolish decisions when it comes to driving things. <laughs> and it is true. And every guy who's in his 40s or 50s knows it's true because they were the same way when they were that age. Um, and as much as we try to tell these young men, don't drive like an idiot, we all remember back when we did the same dumb thing. <laughs> and so, um, uh, uh, because oftentimes these young people, okay, this is a very true verse, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, or right? our sin nature um, uh, is in every one of us, and as a child you, 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 you need guidance and correction because that foolishness is there, uh, but the rod of correction shall drive it uh, far from him. Okay, Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, the rod of correction uh, tried far from him. Proverbs 23, 13, withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. How's that for a verse? Um, uh, uh, Proverbs 23, 14, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Proverbs 26.3, a whip for the horse and a bridle for the ass and a rod for the fool's back. Proverbs 29.15, the rod and reproof give, uh, the rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now, there's certainly direction for us in God's word for proper reproof, proper correction, proper chastisement. All right, this is judgment. This is saying, okay, wrong has been done, and uh, uh, we need to correct that wrong, um, and we need to make sure that that wrong is taken care of and dealt with. To leave that wrong go in the life of somebody will cause that person eventually to continue down the wrong road, and it, and it has devastating effects in the long run, and everybody understood this at one time. Right, the child that's left to act the way however they want to act and do whatever they want to do, um, as a young child, it may be small things now, but it grows into bigger things later as they are never corrected. They are never, um, you know, uh, chastised for their wrongdoing. And then what is a simple thing at a young age becomes a much bigger thing at an older age and leads to a life of going against uh, even greater authorities as they get older. Now, that being said, we understand that the Bible teaches judgment. The Bible teaches um, a, a chastisement. The Bible teaches reproof. Okay? The Bible teaches these things. But the Bible also teaches mercy. And sometimes it's hard to find this balance between mercy and judgment. Now, this really comes into play um, when you are running a Christian school. I've never had to deal more with this idea of, you know, judgment versus mercy uh, than when I've had to, you know, work in a Christian school with volunteer parents who are all involved, right? Because people have different personalities and people sometimes fall on the side of judgment and other times they fall on the side of mercy. And sometimes it depends whether it's their child that's going to get into trouble <laughs> or whether it's not their child. Uh, and a lot of parents seem to fall on the side of mercy when it comes to their own child. Um, uh, and I, I've had people tell me all the time, all the time, if I had a dollar for every time I heard a parent say this, I'd have a lot of money. <laughs> but they'll say this, Pastor, you need to, to, to break, come down on, on, on the rules, and even if it's my own child, you just correct them and tell them, you know, that they, they need to straighten up, because even my own child, they need to follow the rules. And they say that. Uh, but number one, you know, they don't want to bother correcting them themselves, so they want the school to do it. All right, and that's just the truth. I'm speaking from eight years of experience of dealing with this. Number two, when it actually comes down to it, it's a whole different story when their child is actually doing something wrong and we want to come down on them. Then we need to have more understanding. Then we need to have more, know the whole situation. You need to know what happened up to this. And it's not right that you would come down on my child, but you didn't come down on the other child. And so-and-so was 
talking and they got away with it, but yet my child was talking and you cracked down on them and why is it you, you're, you're not consistent? You know, all of a sudden they come to this huge defense of their child. Now, that being said, there is a balance between judgment and mercy. So we have in, that, in Romans chapter number 9, this idea of mercy and God's mercy to us. And I want to give you some practical points showing God's mercy towards us. And don't you thank God tonight, all right, that he just didn't stand on the side of judgment, that he had mercy on us. So we're going to look at this idea of mercy. We see God's mercy towards us, and he said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse number 15. Uh, verse number <clears throat> uh, 16, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but, God, but of God that showeth mercy. In other words, you know, it's God's sovereignty that's going to be able to show mercy. And as I said earlier, uh, one could make a rightful argument that, it's, uh, one could make the argument, it's not right, but one could make the argument, God is not right here by showing mercy because we deserve judgment. But God in his sovereignty does show mercy towards us. Verse 18, therefore... Uh, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. So God's going to show us mercy. I'm going to give you several points tonight on us having the same mercy that God has, all right, towards, um, uh, towards others that God would sometimes, or God shows towards us. I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, um, before we get into our points, I want you to notice that this mercy that God is showing is not just for the chosen people. Notice if you would, verse number 25. Well, look if you would, verse number, look at verse number 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory in the vessels of mercy, which he had afore uh, prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. God's mercy extended not just to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles. Notice if you would, verse 25 and 26. As he saith also in Osi, which is Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You're not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. So God is extending his mercy, not just to the Jewish people, not to what we would call his chosen people, but rather also to the Gentiles as well, beyond just the Jewish people. Verse number 25, of, not of the Jewish, the Jews only. Uh, verse number 27, Isaiah's is also Christ concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a, re a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. But a short work will the Lord uh, make upon the earth. And, Isaiah, and as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed. We had been um, as uh, Sodom and had uh, and been made like unto Gomorrah. All right. So God has left a remnant, not a complete destruction. He has shown mercy to Israel as well, and has always left a remnant that would be, um, you know, not completely annihilating them. It wasn't for um, the Lord, you know, the Lord God Jehovah Adonai had Jehovah. Um, uh, we, the, the children of Israel would also be like Sodom and Gomorrah was completely annihilated, completely destroyed. But God did not do that either. He's always left a remnant showing mercy to them as well. Verse 30, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So because they were not accepting God by faith, all right, because they were not stepping out and accepting God by faith, rather just trying to keep the works of the law, um, they ended up stumbling at that stumbling stone. Verse 33, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a, stumbl a stumbling stone or a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Who is that stumbling stone or rock of offense? The Lord Jesus Christ. By faith, they should have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, but they didn't. They were too busy trying to keep the law. And as a result of that, they did not see righteousness. However, the Gentiles accepted it by faith and received righteousness. Um, uh, so it would have come down to as a matter of faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we see God's mercy, right, 
in all of this. In all these verses, we see God being merciful to us. He could have destroyed, he could have annihilated Israel altogether, like Sodom and Gomorrah. But he didn't. In his mercy, he kept a remnant. Um, uh, and, and, and his mercy extends to not just the Jewish people, but the Gentiles as well, or to you and I. Some practical points on showing mercy tonight. As you and I try to strike this balance between judgment and mercy, all right, let's look at a couple of things. Number one, to show mercy shows self-control. Notice, if you would, verse number... Uh, well, verse number 15 says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 16, So then it is not of him that willeth, or of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. When it comes to God, okay, God showed mercy not based upon him that willeth or him that runneth. Not based upon our actions at all. God himself in his sovereignty showed mercy to man. For us to show mercy at a time when um, we could be showing judgment shows self-control. Oftentimes our desire to bring down hard on judgment is a reaction to being angry about the situation. When really we could stop and show mercy. Um, and it shows self-control in our own life to be able to have mercy uh, in any particular situation. All right? Some practical points about showing mercy. To show mercy is to show self-control. Um, to show that we are going to stop and step back from the situation and look at several aspects, all right? What if I were in their situation? What are all the facts involved before I crack down on judgment? Um, uh, uh, is there an area where I could show mercy? And could I say to myself, you know what, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would have done the same thing. Oftentimes we have people come to our church that are involved in, in sin in their own life. And, and sometimes they... Um, uh, they're not real repentant of it because they don't necessarily see it as wrong as it is. Uh, sometimes they know that it's wrong, but they want to do it anyways. Uh, and it would be easy for me to cast judgment on them and say, you know, what's wrong with you, you wicked sinner? Uh, uh, but yet they need someone who's going to show mercy and say, listen, I know a God that can forgive you for your sins. And I know a God that shows mercy, and I want to show you mercy, and I want to help you, okay? And, the, and it shows self-control on our part not to react to the sin or to the, the, the wanting to bring down judgment, all right? To show mercy shows self-control. <coughs> Some, just four of them quickly here, number two. To show mercy is not an excuse for the offender. So here's an interesting thing, right? God showed his mercy in verse number 15. Not because of anything man does, but because of God, that he shows mercy in verse number 16. Verse number 17, he demonstrates that he is sovereign. Um, uh, for the scripture saith uh, unto Pharaoh, even for this uh, same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power um, uh, in thee, and that my uh, name might be declared throughout all the earth. And so God used Pharaoh uh, and hardened his heart that he could show his power. Therefore, verse 18, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And God in his sovereignty does that. So he's demonstrating his sovereignty. I won't take a lot of time to explain those verses other than to say, you know, Pharaoh had gotten to the point where he had already hardened his heart against God, and God continued that hardening, and God in his sovereignty did this, and they're demonstrating God's sovereignty. Notice, if you would, verse number 19. So you have verse number 17 and 18 saying that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Verse number 19. Thou wilt say then unto me, this is Paul writing this now. And so Paul says, here's what you might be, here's what you might, you might, you might, here's what you might think. Here's what you might say about this in light of what I just said, right? Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Or in other words, how can he find any fault to me? It's his will anyways. You just said that you, you hardened Pharaoh's heart, Right? You're the one who hardens his heart, and you're the one making all these things happen anyways. How can you find fault to me? I'm just doing your will. That's what the argument could be. And that's what Paul is saying the argument might be. One may say, all right, um, uh, uh, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And then he answers that with this. But nay, O man, who art thou that that, uh, that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? In other words, God has given us a balance between his, you know, his sovereignty and our free will. 
And God can choose to let us have a free will, and he does. And who are we to argue with God about that? All right, thou will say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault who hath resisted his will? Verse number 19. Paul imagines someone asking, if it is all a matter of God's choice, then how can God find fault with me? How can anyone go against God's choice? Okay, nay, but, O oh man, thou art the, thou, who art thou that replies against God? Verse 20. Paul replies by showing how disrespectful such a question is. If God says he is sovereign, and if God also says that we are responsible before him, who are we to question him? God is sovereign, but has allowed us a free will, and we are responsible for God, and who are we to question or argue, argue with God against that? All right? Showing mercy, and God showed mercy to us, is not an excuse, all right, or a, a condoning of the sin that we're committing. Oftentimes, we have a difficult time showing somebody mercy because we don't want them to think it's okay what they did. We want to come down with judgment. We want to say we don't want to condone or let them know that what they did was okay, so we're going to come down hard on them. And they'll learn their lesson. Um, okay, now, showing mercy is not excusing the sin. Showing mercy is not saying it's okay that you did that. Showing mercy is not giving an excuse to say we're okay that you're okay with that. But it is within your power to show mercy at times, and you can show mercy without condoning the behavior of the offender. Um, or give an excuse to the one who was the offender or condoning the sin that they had done. To show mercy is not an excuse for the offender. Number three, <clears throat> some practical points on, on mercy or showing mercy. Number three, showing mercy brings in those who would otherwise... Okay, showing mercy brings in those who would otherwise be left out. Notice if you word verse, would, verse number 25 and 26. As he saith also in uh, Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which were not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where, I was said, where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. The Gentiles are brought into the body of Christ through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the message of Paul, right? Showing mercy or God's mercy brought a plan of salvation that would include the Gentiles as well. And showing mercy brings in those who would otherwise be left out. All right, as a church, we want to keep a high standard of what is right um, we want to keep a high standard in our services. We want our music to reflect the glory of God, not the worldliness of man. We want our services to bring praise and honor to him, not praise to man. That's why we sing in a certain way. That's why we, you know, there are certain things that we uh, don't allow uh, in our church service because we don't want those things. We don't want the, you know, we don't want the worldly methods of today to affect our church services, hence taking the eyes off of the Lord and then focusing them on man. Um, the way we perform our music is to bring glory to God. Um, uh, we don't want to bring glory to ourselves. We want to put God first. Okay, all that being said, we have a high standard, and as a church we have a high standard. We continue to keep that high standard. Um, as personal believers, we want to do all our best to serve God. Uh, and so we want to have a high standard in our life of what, uh, before the Lord, of what we should, how we should dress, how we should act, how we should behave ourselves, things that we say, the words that we say. All that being said, in that kind of environment, we can tend to get self-righteous. We can tend to get to the place where we, have, we are arriving where we need to be, and what's wrong with you? How come you're not where you need to be? And rather than cast judgment on somebody that isn't where you at, where you are at, you should be showing mercy to them. By the grace of God, they will grow to become what they ought to be. And by the grace of God, you can have mercy and continue to grow yourself into what you ought to be. And showing mercy brings in those who would have otherwise been left out. Hey, people come to our church uh, and, and they're all welcome to come. I have stood in the foyer way talking to a, a, a man, I think that was a specific situation, and there was a man um, who, 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 who's been, just been out in the world, a lost man, got saved recently, and right in the middle of the foyer of the church, he was talking to me, and he threw out probably two or three cuss words in the sentence. 
didn't even realize what he was saying. And, uh, and never even knew it. I mean, said the whole sentence, threw out three or four, cuss, two or three cuss words, and kept on talking, never realized he said these bad words. I just figured, I hear the words from my wife every day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it, hey, you were going to get people like that in church. They got a, a, a rough background. You know, we want to show mercy to them and love them. Because with the grace of God, you know, we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. And we would be the same place that they are. Um, when we show mercy... We're extending a love towards someone that will allow us to have influence over them. And of course, to the extent that you are offended by somebody, to that extent you are losing influence. Uh, so you want to con continue to have influence over them and to bring them in, all right? Um, uh, and so showing mercy uh, shows self-control. Showing mercy is not an excuse for the offender. Showing mercy brings in those who would uh, otherwise bring in those who would be left out. And showing mercy does not mean righteous will not be done. Because showing mercy does not mean righteousness will not be done. Notice, if you would, verse number 27 and 28. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish, notice this, he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. The Lord will carry um, out his will upon the earth. And although God shows mercy, that mercy will eventually, he's long-suffering. But that will come to an end and judgment will come upon this earth. And thank God he has been as long-suffering as long as he has been. And been as merciful as much as he has been. Showing mercy does not mean righteousness will not be done. All right, so as we are showing mercy to others, uh, when we could be showing judgment, that does not mean we're never going to have righteous being done. We're not excusing all the wicked and it's just going to continue to run rampant. No, um, we are showing mercy as well as judgment, and there has to be a balance of the two. There has to be correction, there has to be reproof. But that has to be tempered with mercy and love. Now, any parent who's raising their child right understands this. You have to let your child know as they're developing their will and they're learning what authority is and right and wrong is. And as they're growing to learn right and wrong, okay, they are um, understanding that you're not going to allow wrong to continue to happen as they get corrected when wrong, you know, when bad things happen. But they also understand that you love them. And they also understand that there is room for, you know, we can talk this out. What happened? You know, why did you do this? Um, you know, since you did wrong, and since you know you did wrong, you're going to have to get punished for the wrong that you've done. But you have to know we're doing this because we love you, and we want you to make right decisions in life. There's, there's room for that. Sit down and talk to them. Love them. Show them. Give them mercy, uh, as well as mercy balanced with judgment. You know, I, I know of children that grew up in homes where the, the father was so strict, he would just fly off the handle over everything. Kid accidentally spills his milk at the table or whatever. Just fly off the handle, mad. Can't you get anything right? Can't you, you're knocking everything over all the time. What's wrong with you? That, that breeds bitterness in, in people. Um, have that balance of mercy and love. All right, let me show you one more thing before we're done. Take your Bibles. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 9. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 9. We, we went over this chapter in our study in the book of Revelation on Saturday night, the Bible studies that we do. And... Uh, we see here in these verses, all right, the, the sixth seal, the seventh seal, seal judgments have been complete, and the seventh seal judgment is at the opening of the trumpet judgments, and chapter number nine is the fifth trumpet, the fifth and sixth trumpet, these are judgments of God, right? God is now judging those that are on the earth in Revelation chapter number nine. The Bible says in verse number one, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now I want you to notice this little phrase here, to him was given. 
okay, was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now, he did not have the key. It had to be permitted for him to be given it to. God was in control. God allowed this to happen, right? Verse number two, and he opened the bottomless pit. Once again, God allowed this to happen. Uh, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of the um, great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So here's these strange locusts coming out of the bottomless pit, and they have these powers, right? Scorpion powers. Notice verse number four. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have the seal of God in their foreheads. Um, and to them it was given that, that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. So these crazy looking beasts are going to torment for five months, and their torment was as the tor uh, torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So here we have these locusts that are striking like scorpions, and they're tormenting for five months. How bad does it get? Notice if you would, verse number six, And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. They want to end it, and they would, they would rather commit suicide than to continue to live with these crazy locusts that are biting them like scorpions, but they can't do it. Verse number 8, And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings um, was as the sound of chariots and many horses running to battle. Now these creatures don't sound very nice in the way they're described. Uh, verse number 10, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. So five months they would torture men. Verse 11, and they, said a king, um, uh, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in Greek tongue uh, his name is Apollyon. Uh, one uh, woe is past, and behold, there cometh two woes more hereafter. So here we have these Strange creatures cut them out of some kind of a bottomless pit on the earth, and they're going to come out, and they're going to, uh, they're described as locusts, but they have this, this look like a woman's hair and lion's teeth and scorpion that are, for five months they're going to torture people to the point where people will want to die, but they can't. This doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? I mean, this is a bad situation. Notice verse number 13. Here's the sixth trumpet. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns, uh, heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which was before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which uh, are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to the slay the third part of the men. So here come these angels out of the Euphrates River, and they're going to slay, actually kill, a third part of men. Verse 16. <clears throat> the number of the army, the horsemen, were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number, uh, and I heard the number of them. Verse number 17, and thus I saw the horses in the vision, and then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jackanth, and brimstone, and the heads uh, of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire, and smoke, and brimstone. These creatures did not sound very good. <laughs> A horse with the head of a lion and a shooting out brimstone. And, uh, and by these three was the third part of the men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. And so here we have these crazy um, locusts coming out of the, the bottomless pit. And they got scorpion abilities and lion's teeth. And they're, they, they're, they're torturing men where they can't even get away from it. They can't even kill themselves to get away from it. Then you have these angels coming out of the Euphrates River. And these beasts, these horses with lion-like heads. And, and uh, uh, just, just a, a, a judgment of God. This is judgment. I mean, if you say this isn't judgment, you're not reading this right. God is now bringing down judgment. I'm going to tell you what, to me, is the most interesting part. You know, the book of Revelation, typically, is not a book of practical application. You know, it's a lot of allegory, a lot of future events. Um, it's more of a book of privilege and information. God's allowing us to know of events that are going to take place. But occasionally, you can find something you could draw practical application from. Right, so here we have this crazy judgment, whether this is allegoric of something different or whether this is literal. I tend to think this is literal. I think these beasts are going to look just like this, and I'm glad I'm not going to be around at that time. <laughs> but what happens 
after this great judgment of God, right? The Bible says in verse 19, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents, and, and they had heads, and with them they do hurt. So we have these tails that have serpents, and they're hurting people. Verse 20, remember they killed, what is it, one, one third of, uh, uh, of the earth? And verse number 20, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands. Now listen, if I were going to go up into battle against God, <laughs> and I wouldn't. But if I did, all right, and God started bringing out giant locusts out of some bottomless pit, and they started coming to me and torturing me for five months, and I couldn't even get away from them, couldn't even kill myself, and then God brought these angels with horses, with lion heads, and all this crazy stuff, you know, okay, God, you win. You're right. I'm wrong. I repent. <laughs> I am not, you know, as soon as I saw that bottle pit open up, I'm done. God, you're right. I'm wrong. You win. I'm not messing with that. Why is it these men repented not after seeing all that? What's the lesson here, all right? Repentance alone, I'm sorry, judgment alone does not bring repentance. Here's great judgment from God. I mean, here is striking judgment that's going to bring, you know, things on this earth I've never seen before. But yet even with all this judgment, the Bible says, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the work of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols and gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Okay, they're worshiping these things that, that don't do anything, and they're going to continue to worship in spite of all this judgment that has come down upon them. Neither repented they of their murderers or of their sorceries, nor of the fornication, nor of their thefts. Okay, so here we see judgment alone. This is God's judgment. It did not produce repentance. We have to, as God did, and God demonstrates in Romans 9, we have to show mercy with judgment. We have to show love, okay, with chastisement. There's a balance here that has to take place in order for repentance to happen. If we didn't know of God's love, how could we ever accept God's judgment that he's going to have on this earth? If we didn't know of God's love and his mercy and his compassion that it says in Romans chapter 9, if we didn't know of his compassion, how could we ever accept the doctrine of hell? How can we ever accept the doctrine of eternal judgment? Because we know that God loves us and that God has provided a way for us and that Christ died for us. We have to have mercy and judgment uh, in order to have proper repentance. All right, let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll take up our prayer request for tonight. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for uh, the simple Bible study tonight. Lord, help all of us to, to do right before you, Lord and to have enough courage to stand up for right. But may we balance that, Lord, with, with love and with mercy and compassion. And uh, Lord, may we understand what it is to live our lives in a way that you would have us to live, uh, doing right but loving others. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for Romans chapter number nine. Uh, Lord, may these, these verses continue to work in us. Thank you for all that you've